Yeah. I'll bet. So yeah. 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 So is there a, is there a time on Friday or is it? Because they've moved within town? Yeah. What's my name? Well, I <laughs> you didn't get my address changed and I told you. What are you looking at? Oh, okay. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Wednesday, April 4th, 2018, uh, regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order, and if you would rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah. Uh, roll call, please. Yeah. Councilor Baybine? Present. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Caterina? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Donovan? Here. Uh, general public comments. Any uh, one wishing to make a comment on anything that is not on the agenda may do so. Please present yourself at the podium. Three minutes and please state your name and address. Thank you. Hello, I'm Gail Bruns, 39 Hanson Road, Scarborough. And I'm the chairperson of the Dog Owners of Greater Scarborough. And I'm here this evening to uh, read a letter in support of continuation of our current dog and beach ordinances. We, the dog owners, would be very concerned if the current ordinances, which were the product of much negotiation and compromise four years ago, were made more restrictive. Uh, the letter I'm going to be reading has been signed by approximately 155 people, mostly Higgins Beach residents, but also other residents and some visitors that we encountered walking their dogs on our beaches during a few very <coughs> cold hours in March. So here is our letter. Members of the town council and residents of Scarborough, <coughs> this is to present an update on the effectiveness of the current dog ordinances at Higgins Beach. The system is not perfect, but it does strike a working compromise between very divergent viewpoints. For the dogs and their owners, there is year-round opportunity to exercise and socialize on a daily basis. The hours are limited and inconvenient for some, but we are grateful that this compromise meets the needs of many. For the plovers, during their season beginning April 1st, more than half the beach is completely off limits to dogs, and statistics show that plovers are prospering with 100 or more chicks fledged statewide during each of the past three years, up from a low of 24 in 2004. For people who wish to experience the beach when dogs are not present, during the long summer season, dogs are prohibited from the beach from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day and are required to be leashed in the evening. During the off-season, leashing is required from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. It may require some forethought to plan for those hours, but again, it is a compromise. Chief Moulton recently commented, and I quote, anecdotally, I have been led to believe that our efforts last year paid off and the culture and behavioral issues had changed in a positive way, end quote. We agree as we continue our efforts to ensure that our system that was reached through compromise works for the vast majority, accommodating beachgoers, dogs, and their owners, fishermen, photographers, wildlife, and people of all ages and interests from our town and surrounding communities. Um, I also have some pictures here, which I know are going to be hard to see, but I've um, submitted them to be distributed to you, along with our signatures and letter. Uh, this is from Higgins Beach. There are two pictures. One is the top um, at 8.30 on a beautiful July day, showing lots of um, people with dogs, surfers. I can't see their faces, but I'm sure they're having a wonderful time. <laughs> and then in the lower picture, uh, shortly after 9 o'clock, I believe it was 9.10, same day, no dogs. Uh, people with the dogs have left, but now we have a new group of a few people that are here to enjoy the beach, and we still have quite a few surfers. So 
Um, I like that picture because I think it shows that our ordinance has a little bit of something for everybody um, on the beach, which really I think should be one of our objectives. So I've given this to um, Tody to distribute to you, and um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else would like to address the council? See, now we'll move to the next item. Uh, adjustments to the agenda, uh, no, uh, minutes of March 21, 2018. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Any comments or corrections? All in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Adjustments to the agenda, there are none. Items to be signed, the treasurer's warrants, I have already signed them. Uh, Non-action items. Uh, the presentation on the proposed municipal and school budgets for fiscal year 2019. We are holding this uh, tonight with a first reading next Wednesday, that, so that we're holding a special town council meeting uh, next Wednesday. There was expressions of interest in seeing the vote that takes place at first reading be the result of more opportunity to actually become familiar with the, with the budget. Uh, while we have to go through a first reading, public hearing, and second reading before we adopt a budget, uh, nevertheless, I think uh, the council feels more comfortable and the public feels more comfortable if we provide ourselves that little bit of extra time and it requires us to come out one more meeting, but uh, I think it's worth it. So having said that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to the town manager and the superintendent for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Just allow me a moment to get settled. Good evening, thank you for your attention. Uh, it's certainly my pleasure to be here as your town manager and, and with my colleague, uh, Dr. Kuchenberger, to present the annual budget to you. Um, historically, this has been presented solely by the town manager. In recent years, we've done this collaboratively. And I think given the magnitude of the school budget uh, in terms of the overall budget, it certainly makes sense for uh, uh, the superintendent to be here and present uh, the school side of the budget. Uh, before we get into the presentation, I just want to make a, a couple of comments at the top. Um, I know my staff has heard me say this probably every year I've been here, and probably staff's uh, past that, but I really do see this year as what I characterize as a correction year. And I say that because uh, many of you that have been engaged in this budget process historically, Scarborough is often uh, the victim, I'll say, or the recipient of uh, some volatile news and very unpredictable news. Um, in this chamber, we've talked in years past uh, about minimal uh, receivership for the school. Well, we've reached that last year. And unless something incredible changes in Augusta, which doesn't seem likely, uh, we're likely to remain with that status. The good news with that, of course, is that we have more predictability, predictability going forward. Uh, as many will recall, in the current year, we have a heavy use of fund balance that we need to uh, certainly pull ourselves back from uh, with a, a sharp correction. And this budget you'll hear tonight does just that. So once those sorts of uh, big volatile items start to settle out, and as I look at the future of our local economy, I think we'll certainly perform as though we have historically for the foreseeable future. So I do very much think that we're going to be at a, a different spot starting next year. Having said that, we've got some challenges to get through. And I don't think I'm saying anything that comes as a surprise uh, to members of council and to those in the public that have kind of paid attention to this process. So in big picture, this is just at a glance, these are the three major components that make up our budget. We have a town portion, a school portion, and a county portion. Um, I'm very pleased on the municipal side to be able to deliver, deliver just under a 2% net budget increase. And I'll be the first to admit I'm able to do that in large part because we have the ability to, to look at non-property tax revenues. And uh, that's something that the school doesn't have the luxury of. 
And so you'll see our gross changes are over five and a half percent, and we'll talk into detail as to what the drivers are for that. On the school side, I will be the first to give credit to the school and, and Julie in particular and Kate uh, for uh, doing what they can within their control, which is the, uh, the gross expenditures. Uh, they're coming in at 2.94 percent uh, total expenditures uh, growth over last year. Uh, as was mentioned just a moment ago, one of their challenges is on the revenue side. They don't have the ability to look at other non-property tax revenue sources, and the use of fund balance shows its ugly face uh, in that net number for the school. The county continues on a uh, on a path that they've been on for some time in the four to five percent budget uh, increase year over year. Uh, they have a lot of their own challenges, particularly with jail funding and some of the unpredictability from the state, I might add. So all told, uh, we have some challenges. Our net budget is, uh, it, at this juncture, is looking to go up over 5% because of all those variables. So what does it mean to all of us? Uh, kind of looking at the bottom line, um, this chart uh, intends to obviously capture the net budget increase, which uh, was the final number on the previous slide. It also takes into account the council's adopted policy for projecting valuation growth. And so uh, based on that policy, we expect a valuation growth between half a percent and about a percent and a half. That's kind of the range that we could expect. Uh, there's obviously a midpoint that can be talked about as well. And so based on those two variables, we're able to predict where the tax rate uh, may fall. And at this point, uh, though we're extremely acutely aware of the council's stated goal of less than 3%. Uh, we're starting the, uh, the conversation tonight slightly above that. Uh, I truly believe, and, and I, I think we can verify this looking back through past budgets, this is one of our best, if not our best, starting point, and I think that's an important feature. There are certainly things that we can talk about going forward, and tonight we'll perhaps touch on what some of those are and what the consequences of those are. But I truly believe um, we started a very good point, and I, I think I can speak for Julie. I feel as though we've remained true to our principles in terms of uh, us being tasked as prof professionals to advise you what we believe we need to maintain current service levels, and that's what we believe the community uh, deserves and expects. Uh, beyond that, we've listened closely to many of the principles that uh, the council and the school board have talked about in terms of funding capital improvements appropriately. Uh, funding school nutrition fully um, um, and certainly accurately and appropriately making our budget requests. Um, I can tell you we have done our part to scour our, our appropriation requests and that really puts us in a position for making this presentation tonight. So on the, uh, I'll stop talking in a moment, but I, I do, I, I have one final piece here. Uh, this year, we, uh, in coordination with the Joint Finance Committee process, it was decided to try community engagement slightly differently. And so starting in uh, January, we held four different meetings at different times of the day, four different locations, and reached over 70 people in those sessions. Um, we called them listening sessions. Our intent was to receive input uh, to help inform us as we're in the budget formation stage. Uh, in large part, from my perspective, uh, <coughs> They were incredibly productive. They were more conversation-based. I think in each case, we were able to kind of exhaust the questions, and the questions, you know, the agenda was formulated by those who came and what was on their minds. Um, in terms of what I heard at that meeting, uh, there was a great interest in maintaining the levels of service that we have. Uh, curbside pickup was the one that came up on several, at several meetings as a municipal service that is appreciated. Um, the other one, which is a bit of a surprise, it doesn't really have budget impact, although we're maintaining our focus and commitment to economic development, is that on more than one occasion, uh, this was a central conversation point, that we really need to be mindful of building our local tax base. And I thought that was a meaningful thing to, to share with you. And with that, I'll give the mic over to my colleague to talk about some of the school issues. So one of the things that we heard um, was this attention to our enrollment and how it's shifting. Um, we did, uh, we analyze our enrollment regularly. We're constantly monitoring that, both current enrollment, but also looking at projections over time. So we're looking all the way out to 2025, and we really use two metrics to monitor our enrollment. We have what's called the best fit model, and then the new housing model. 
and those were done back in January 2016 um, as we started looking at our facilities and part of our long range facilities plan. But it proves to be an important tool to us on the school side as we're making critical decisions in terms of program needs, um, staffing, uh, facilities, etc. And so one of the things that we're noticing in our enrollment is that over the next two years, both at Wentworth and at the middle school, we're going to see a bit of an enrollment dip, but then we'll see the enrollment increasing in the following two years. So there's some opportunity for us this year and next year to maximize our current staff with those dips in enrollment at those two phase levels. We also see at the high school our enrollment's going to go up this year, um, and then we're going to see four years where the enrollment starts to decline, and in fact, by 2023, our high school enrollment will be below 900, um, so some of the lowest that it's been in a number of years. And conversely, at the K-2 levels, we see um, our enrollment projecting to be increasing. So at Blue Point, um, we'll have over 200 students by 2019. At Eight Corners, by 2023, we'll have we're projected to have about 266 students. There's currently about 220 there, um, plus or minus a few students. And at Pleasant Hill, we'll also see enrollment increasing um, so that we'll have over 200 students at Pleasant Hill by 2020. And so imagining those students moving through our system year by year and how that will impact our programming. So that's very critical for us to be paying attention to and thinking about as we make both short-term and long-term budget decisions. So with those enrollment dips, both at the middle school and Wentworth that we're projected to experience over the next two years, we have the opportunity to listen, to respond to something our community has been asking us for for a number of years. And this has come up in our community dialogue um, while I was here and also before my arrival in the district is, you know, how do we expand those world language experiences to the lower grades? Um, and so we believe that with our enrollment projections as they are, we're able to bring world language down to fifth grade. Um, currently, our sixth graders have some world language um, experience and they dabble in both French and Spanish. Um, next year, we'll be able to bring that down to fifth grade. And I should also note here that we'll be able to increase the frequency in which our sixth grade students are accessing their world language curriculum. And that will require no new investment for us that's utilizing our existing staff. Similarly with our music programs, this is another thing that we heard about. We actually had a pretty um, healthy debate at one of our listening sessions about um, which does our community value more. And there are some community members who were really advocating for more world language opportunities and some who were saying, you know, I feel like we need to expand our music opportunities. <coughs> So again, at the middle school this year, with existing staff, no new investment, we'll be able to offer general music to all of our eighth grade students for the first time in a number of years. Um, currently in eighth grade, students have the opportunity to participate in band, and about 30 to 40% on any given year are accessing band in eighth grade, um, but they're not then having that general music experience. And the research is really clear that when students have a gap year, so to speak, um, in the general music curriculum, they're less likely to pick it back up in, um, in the high school. And what we're really excited about, we have this amazing music teacher, Mr. Bizup, at the middle school who has a great idea for a kind of DIY technical sort of um, general music experience. So we're um, you know, looking at grant opportunities to help fund some materials for that um, so we can make this experience happen for our eighth grade students. So in terms of the primary drivers, I'll start on the town side and then uh, Julie will certainly turn it over to the, the schools, school side. Uh, many of the variables are very familiar to all of us, I think. Uh, they should be. Um, first and foremost, uh, we have in significantly increased debt service costs. We have voter approved uh, bonds, particularly for the public safety building. Uh, there were some CIP borrowing as well, but uh, this year we, we did go out and sell $15 million of bonds for that project. Uh, not surprisingly, we see an increase uh, of about $765,000 in our debt service cost. Uh, again, those were voter approved bonds. No one should be surprised. Uh, that was an expected thing. Um, similarly, uh, what we've tried to do this year, and it's been a conversation, I think, in every budget that I've been part of, uh, is uh, really being thoughtful about how we're funding our capital improvement projects. Uh, we do have policies we, uh, we look to adhere to. Uh, beyond that, when the going gets tough, typically in budget discussions, nearing the finish line, uh, there's all sorts of other considerations, other ways to advance those projects other than funding them through appropriation. Um, I've tried to remain uh, 
true to that principle in this budget. Uh, those are some discussion and conversation points we'll have. Uh, so in that regard, we have uh, $450,000 more in uh, appropriations towards CIP this year than we did last year. That's a driver for us, for sure. Those are choices that we can talk about and you can make. Uh, I should mention the residential revaluation, which has been a discussion point and I think a priority of this council um, is, is the lion's share of that um, uh, in the capital improvement project. Uh, again, something the council is familiar with and I, and I got the word that we wanted to see, so here it is. And lastly, uh, you know, the town budget, um, slightly less than the school, over 60% of our budget are people-based, it's salaries and benefits, and just the natural uh, increase in healthcare costs, um, labor contracts, um, so on and so forth, uh, has a significant effect uh, on our budget, no question. So let's turn to the school side. So as the manager mentioned earlier, we have this fund balance gap that we need to fill this year. We know that last year, um, in order to reach the approved budget, we utilized $2.1 million in fund balance. Um, upon approval of the budget from day one, a curtailment was put in place, and our leadership team was charged with um, really thinking how, how they could navigate through the year being as conservative as possible. And that was um, a very conscientious effort that involved staff input um, and a lot of dialogue for us to make those tough decisions. Uh, the purpose of that was to help us try to generate fund balance for this year, which we knew last year was going to be an even more challenging year. Um, and we, I'm happy to report to the council that we've been successful in doing that, and we anticipate that the end of FY18 we'll have about 250 to $300,000 in fund balance, which is, um, you know, part of this proposal that we're sharing with you today and allowing us to um, present the you know, less than 3% gross increase in our budget and less than 6% net increase in our budget. We also have the benefit this year of experiencing an increase in our GPA, um, the general purpose aid that's coming, that's being allocated to us from the state level, and that really has to do with the way the formula has been adjusted and is calculating our um, special education costs. We're still minimum receivers. Um, it's just that given the amount that we're spending on special ed and with it being 40% of it rather than 33%, it looks like we're, well, we are receiving more um, GPA this year, which is important for us as we think about um, how do we maintain our programs. Another driver for us is the amount and types of required and appropriate services for our students. Um, so part of that's driven by enrollment, um, part of that's driven by new students coming to us with specialized needs that we are required both um, federally and you know, federally to provide for those students. And so you'll see that in a bit how that's impacting our budget this year. And then just like on the town side, salaries and benefits. So for the school department, um, salaries and benefits make up about 74.5% of our budget, and um, that's actually driving our budget in both directions. Um, again, looking at that enrollment and being really um, re fiscally responsible in terms of staffing, we were able to make some reductions in our level services budget, which I'll show you in just a few moments, but it also um, you know, is driving our budget in the other way due to contractual needs and um, incoming needs of students. Okay, so this year, um, our lovely business manager, Kate Bolton, created this tool, which I think really helps illustrate the process that we go through. One of the things we worked on in the school department was simplifying our language. We really want to have um, a way of communicating with the community that is free of jargon. And although we follow a very similar process, um, multi-step process internally, we're trying to simplify that message um, as we engage the community. So what you see at the top here in the yellow is our FY18 final approved budget. That's our current year budget. Um, and what we do annually is we take um, what we call level services. So basically, if we close the doors in June and open them back up in August, what would um, that the same level of services look like? And then we go through a line-by-line -line analysis with each department um, and each building principal to really scrutinize all of our spending and talk about what are the needs that are before us now based on evidence, what's the return on investment based on our FY18 investments, um, and that work, I'm proud to say, this year has resulted in um, a $637,000 reduction um, 
dollar <coughs> reduction. And so if we were to stop right here, um, just from that line by line analysis and that um, scrutiny that our, our leadership team has gone through, we would be at a gross increase of 2.77% and a net increase of 5.9%. But we don't get to decide which students are gonna come to us or what needs we're going to have or how enrollment is going to be adjusted. So we then um, go even further and we look at the budget through um, retirements and enrollment shifts and what are the positions that can be left unfilled. You know, are there program shifts that need to occur based on student needs? And so it's another layer of analysis that occurs. And so if we were to stop right here, um, our budget would be a gross increase of 1.95% and a net increase of 4.78%. Um, but we know that we have funding needs. We have some funding needs that are mandated and required, um, and that's included in the yellow figure that you see there. We also have in our proposed budget this year um, a request to take some of our part-time employees that work through the school department in supporting all of our technology and bringing them to full-time employees. And then right now our enrollment needs um, at Pleasant Hill are such that it's um, looking like we would have about 22 or 23 kindergartners in each classroom, which well exceeds our expectations for what we would hope to have in a kindergarten classroom. And so this includes a request for one kindergarten teacher. Um, and that's it. Those are the new investments that we have in our budget this year. Um, there's other things on our unmet needs list um, and the handout that went around really articulates that for you. So again, in our goal of simplifying our language, on um, the, the one side we're showing you what does this budget allow us to do and then what are some of the unmet needs. So even though we're not making a lot of new investments, we are really looking at how do we support um, our students and their individual needs through programming? How do we maximize investments that we've already made um, in the forms of technology? How do we maintain? Um, and then it also highlights the expansion of some of those programs that I talked to you about before. On the other side, if you turn it over, it also shows you, you know, what are we investing in? So that's what I just articulated to you there. And then what are the reductions? And I think this is a really important area for our community to notice that we're reducing two positions at the middle school this year. We're reducing one position at Wentworth this year, again, due to those enrollment adjustments. Um, and then we're reducing personnel costs, as you see in the green figure here, through breakage, you know, retirements, attrition, um, enrollment shifts, and unfilled positions. And then that big work that the leadership team did in the line-by-line -line analysis and reduction of line item expenses is highlighted on this form for you as well. Okay, so <coughs> you might be thinking, um, well, what are, what, is the, what are some other things that we need to keep in mind? Um, this really is a bare bones budget, and I know that our goal would be for it to be a net increase that's much lower than under 6%, um, but we really feel that this is the most responsible budget, most um, uh, fiscally responsible budget that we can present to the council um, based on the needs that we have. Our next step, if there are further reductions that have to take place, will be a reduction in force. Um, and so that's never an enjoyable process to go through, um, but that's just the current reality of where we are. We wanted to really come out and give you our bare bones budget um, that is just what we need, while also articulating what the unmet needs were so that you had full consideration in any decisions that you make moving forward. Um, and again, the reason for sharing those unmet needs with you is so that you can see, you know, some of these requests you've heard before, some of them you've heard a couple of times before, they still continue to be on our list. Um, and these are investments that we know we'll need to make to continue um, to improve our school system in incremental ways. So given the work we put in and kind of where we're starting from the town side, the next level cut uh, we'll be looking at changing levels of service and reducing them somehow. Uh, what those are, what magnitude, are certainly the subject of future discussion. But from my perspective, the next level cut, uh, we will see some service, impact on service. Uh, and again, we can talk about what that is and whether that's acceptable, but just be prepared, that's the next level. Um, on the positive side, I should mention, though it's not at all included in any of the uh, forecasting we've had here, 
Uh, the town council did fund and we're underway with a commercial industrial revaluation. That work will be progressing through the course of the spring. And so we do expect that to have, uh, we'll have some new, new information, perhaps before the council takes final reading and second reading on the vote, on the, on the budget. And I think certainly before the school validation vote, we should have clarity so we could talk further about that. But I think that's something to tuck in the back of your mind that I expect that will be certainly impactful on the uh, expected tax rate in a positive way, how much remains to be seen. And we don't think it's prudent to do any of that modeling at this point. It's total conjecture. And so uh, as we progress, we'll have more information in that regard. Uh, quickly about the budget book. Uh, it is uh, hefty. We didn't try to set any record by weight or pages. Uh, we think this is all relevant and good information for one reason or another. Um, our design approach, again, has been to really prepare a document that has something for everyone. Uh, those that want to take a cursory view, those that want to take a deep dive. Um, we have continued the tradition of a, an enhanced summary analysis uh, portion in tab two. Uh, I think you'll find some good historical trending data. Um, certainly, you can always improve that, and I'm, I'm open for suggestions. Uh, on the town side, we have, for those that want to take a very quick glance, we have at a glance for each department. This is uh, kind of a, a quick little picture, uh, not really numbers or budget driven, more introducing what the departments do and kind of the value they bring to the town. And then, of course, beyond that, there is the deeper dive all the way down the line item detail should people want to dig that deep. Um, that's the line item detail. And then this year, I'll let Julie speak to this. It's a new thing on the school side. So we're really excited about tab eight, um, which is the school department tab. This is where we um, worked really hard to get creative with how we're presenting and celebrating both our successes um, and our fast facts. So like what are some of the accomplishments that um, each building or each department is experiencing. So you'll see little did you know sections um, in each subsection of the of the school department tab and our goal really was again to simplify our language to be jargon free to be positive to help people understand where your tax dollars are going and the types of um, things that you're investing in so I think you'll be really impressed to see how successful our youngest students are all the way up through our high school students and all of those fast facts are included here some great pictures of our amazing students um, and also try to make it just something you want to read um, so we're hoping that and looking forward to your feedback on how you're experiencing the budget book this year in that way um, and then we're also looking at some other communication tools that will be coming out based on feedback from the community such as a mailer um, and a couple of like one pager ideas so um, I think you'll really enjoy looking through the tab eight of the budget book this year so how do you stay engaged through the budget process um, we're excited to announce that the new budget portal is up and running and we're starting to populate that with some um, of our budget information the idea is to make it easier to navigate um, but also be really informative so that um, is on our website now for you to begin exploring we'll also be having the neighborhood budget meetings um, and this is going to be um, facilitated by one counselor and one school board member at each of the four locations and they'll be coming around you know to talk with the community firsthand to answer your questions about the budget um, now that you have it to kind of start digging into um, but also just to get feedback from you and hear from you what kind of questions you might have and how we can be getting more information out to you before you come out to vote on June 12th. Um, the first one is right around the corner on Monday, so you can mark your calendars, and if it's anything like the listening sessions, I think that you may want to even participate in more than one. That's what some of the feedback that we received was that each, uh, at each location, the conversation changed based on the community members who were able to attend, so I don't think you could, you know, attend too many of them. So the next steps in the budget process, this is a quick overview. Things uh, start to pick up speed very quickly. Uh, starting tomorrow, uh, the school board, the leadership and the school board will meet all afternoon, as you see, here in these chambers uh, to really do a deep dive on the school side. And tomorrow evening, um, the, they'll actually accomplish first reading of the budget for the school budget. Then as mentioned by the council chair, uh, the council will schedule a special public meeting for next Wednesday, April 11th for its first reading. 
it's a single item agenda, so we're trying to give the budget uh, the attention it deserves, and uh, so that will be held next week. And then we have public hearings scheduled for May 2nd, second reading on May 16th. School board member the board will do their second reading the following night on the 17th, and all of that culminates on the school budget validation vote at the high school on June 12th. Um, I should also mention on the town side, the town's finance committee is the group that's relegated the uh, honor and responsibility of really the detailed review of the budget. Uh, that's going to take the next five weeks. Uh, they have a pretty aggressive schedule. Most of them are Tuesday nights uh, on the budget portal. That schedule is, is published, and so certainly you can pay attention there. Those meetings involve uh, department heads coming in and spending time directly one-on-one -on -one with the finance committee, answering their questions. Uh, so anything you want to know about the schools, the town side, um, certainly attend one of those meetings. Um, I guess finally, uh, do you have any final comments you want to make? I think that if you're able to attend tomorrow's workshop during the day, it's going to be a really deep dive. You're going to be able to hear from principals and department heads firsthand exactly you know, what's in this budget and what's not. One of the things we really tried to do was uh, switch the narrative so it's less of the deficit kind of thinking of what are we taking away from the budget and more starting with the bare bones and um, giving you a menu if you'd like to see us add more into the budget. Um, maybe not this year, but we're just trying to really change the narrative so it becomes much more positive and people really know what is in this budget for me to come out and support and um, how are we going to see the return on that investment. So it's really meant for you to you know, dig into that budget book and really use that as a tool. And we do generally want your feedback on what more would you like to know about the school so that you really understand where your, your tax dollars are going. So I, I want to make sure I thank staff. Uh, this year I did something unprecedented. I put the challenge up to staff uh, to really help me do the work. And typically I put that weight on my shoulders. Uh, my staff performed incredibly well, and that really uh, put me in a position to be able to present the budget I did. So I very much appreciate the efforts uh, that they undertook. Um, certainly I encourage folks to make themselves available, uh, all the resources online. If there's something that's not there that you think should be there, be in touch. We'll do our best to get it up. Um, and I know I can speak for Julie with this. Uh, at this point, we kind of shift the responsibility over to the respected uh, elected bodies. It's now your process. It's now your budget. Uh, we stand ready to help, uh, help you understand it, to help uh, you make some tough decisions. Um, and we're <coughs> prepared to do that over the next uh, seven or eight weeks. And I guess finally, uh, on a personal note, um, obviously this, this community is going through some challenging times right now with some real serious issues. And Maybe I'm naive, but I would like to think that the budget is something that we can all uh, get involved with uh, in terms of process and ideally get behind in terms of product. Um, at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's not about the superintendent or our staffs. We're here to serve the public, and the budget is the vehicle through which uh, we're able to provide the level of services that uh, we hear the community wanting. So um, again, I'd, I'd like to think this is a process that we could all find our way to, to get involved with and ultimately support. Um, so thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, this is our first look. We have not seen this before, so uh, I'm not looking for counselors to uh, comment, but if they have a question that they might want to ask the superintendent or the town manager, uh, please feel free. Katie. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you because I know uh, putting this out in advance of first reading was something that I pushed for quite heavily and I know that it, uh, you were concerned about being able to do that but for me uh, not having to try to vote on something that I've seen for 30 seconds because um, I'm going to have some bedtime reading to do uh, is much appreciated so I appreciate your efforts on that. Yes. Other, other questions? Peter? Yeah, it, 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 much of, it's not much of the questions, it's kind of, you know, I think I, I think we start at the top saying at least the council goals this year was try to get the budget passed the first time through and to come in with a number that's 3% or less were, were our goals. So I think what might be helpful as we have a conversation over the coming weeks would be to get a, a more granular understanding of what does it mean if we, if to get to that 3% number. 
Um, so I think that needs to be some, some, a challenge to both teams to say, what do those things look like? So we can, I think for our community, they're gonna have to decide what are the services they want and what are they willing to, to pay for? So I think having a better understanding of what some of those things are would be really helpful to frame up those choices. And I think that's where we wanted to be, is to be able to have those tough conversations as a community about with the resources we have, what do we want to deliver? So that, that'd be my only point. I think we need some of those tough questions answered about what it means. Thank you. Other comments or questions of the superintendent or the town manager? Uh, can you speak to the availability of budget books for people who actually want to delve into this tome? We do have books available uh, at the library. I handed it off to Nancy as she left. Uh, the town clerk's office will have one as well. Certainly the entire book is available through PDF form, downloadable uh, through the budget portal. Uh, and I think on occasions in the past, we've actually printed books uh, at the request of residents. That can get pricey. Uh, we don't don't want to get in the habit of necessarily printing a lot of extra books, but that's certainly an option if someone really wants it. But um, they should be available uh, for folks if they really make the effort. So online access would be through the town's website? Yes, and it's up and running as we speak. It's, so uh, it's available now. Yeah. So members of the public will be able to uh, have uh, easy access library here at Town Hall on your computer. Yes. And that's very important for people who really want to dig into this. Uh, I do want to thank the uh, uh, Board of Education members for uh, coming today, all the department heads uh, who were here. Uh, we really do appreciate you taking the time, uh, having watched the development of this budget. I recognize that the department heads have been uh, being very tough to, to uh, keep this to uh, as low a budget as is being presented. Uh, Chris. Uh, I just wanted to point out, and I, I appreciate the fact that it's available online in PDF form. I, I'd like to make sure that that's a searchable PDF form. We've had that challenge in the past where it's not one giant document, and I'd be happy to take that offline uh, and talk about what that means afterwards. And uh, uh, the, the school board sessions tomorrow, uh, for people who are really interested in the, uh, in the school board budget, are invaluable. Uh, uh, I've attended them before, and you really do come away with a tremendous insight into how the school gets to the numbers they get to. So, Bill, thank you. Yes, Jean Marie. Uh, I just want to point out I was just poke, looking up to see how I find the portal because I can't find things sometimes. And it, if you go to the town of Scarborough, uh, the landing page for us, it's on the left hand side and it's right under town government. It says town council, town manager, boards and committees, and then it says specifically town and school budget portal, because I'm used to having to go into something to find it out. So just so the public will know that it's right there, it's pretty obvious, so just so you know. So Jean Marie, can we do a little demo? Well, if the internet will come up here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, maybe. Yeah, see it's on the right. See under town government? Um, right here. Oh, right there. There you go. And this is the fancy new budget portal. Mm -hmm. It has these big buttons, so if you are interested in the municipal budget, you'll click on here, and it'll take you to documents related specifically to that. Um, it also has the calendar there for you. The school budget is here, um, and other upcoming events and news will be located under this tab here. So that's the neighborhood budget meetings listed there. Council Rowan. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, in years past, um, there have been, uh, given that this is April and that the budget doesn't start until July, um, there have been um, uh, kind of estimates about some of the numbers that are, that are in the first reading of the budget. I assume we're in a similar position now where we don't necessarily know insurance costs or um, other costs that might come firm up later. There are some moving targets, but I can tell you I'm right at the lo my level of comfort. I'm pa probably past it. Uh, I've probably been more aggressive using some history and some um, gut, if you will, to start a budget conversation in a different place, but likely much, much closer to where we'll end up. So there's not as much, from my perspective, float from here on out. Uh, we're starting off uh, assuming a lot of things uh, based on historical performance. But uh, presumably those, those uh, 
assumptions could also be faulty. I mean, they, they could come in higher. Yeah, yeah. that's a, a great point. I, I should have mentioned it earlier. You're right. We could get some bad news as we progress. Uh, insurance rates could go up a couple percent higher, and that's a lot of money, uh, depending on which insurance. So uh, we'll certainly inform you as we get better information as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the uh, the date of the June twelfth uh, uh, school budget referendum uh, uh, indicated that it was eight a.m. to eight p.m. voting. Typo. It's seven a.m. The town clerk informs me that it's seven a.m. to eight p.m. Further questions? No. I, I presume the uh, presentation is going to be online as well on the budget board. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank uh, you. We'll move on. And we'll take a moment to uh, let uh, the audience uh, exit. Thank you, everyone, for coming and Look forward to a, uh, a, a full opportunity for public input uh, and counselor debate and discussion uh, next Wednesday night. Thank you. Public hearing, I'll ask you to give a brief introduction. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're back in order. Uh, order number 18-25, 7 p.m. public hearings on the proposed amendments to Chapter 313A. The Town of Scarborough Property Tax Assistance Program, Section 5, Determination of Eligibility and Amount of Eligibility, Subsection 2, Eligibility for Renters, and Update the Application Form. The Ordinance Committee Chair uh, is Councilor Caterina. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, this is, it's a very small but very important um, change under eligibility for renters which allows those who live in manufactured housing and are leasing land or renting land, so to speak, to be able to be included in our senior property tax assistance uh, program, which I think is essential. Um, so I'm very happy that the um, Ordinance Committee passed it out, and we talked about it last time we met, and I hope everyone supports it this time. And this is a public hearing. Uh, it is not a second reading. So uh, anyone wishing to address the council on this matter may approach the podium. Close the public hearing and move to the next uh, order, number 18-27, uh, 1826. Uh, act on the request from the Vacation Land Dog Club Incorporated and York County Kennel Club for a mass gathering permit for the AKC sanctioned dog show, the Southern Maine Coastal Classic, located at Wasamke Springs Campground, scheduled for Thursday, May 17, 2018, through Sunday, May 20, 2018. And I am reading a corrected uh, uh, date, uh, which had a typographical error in it. Uh, and I would ask the town clerk to speak to this matter this, initially. This is an annual event that um, is, is held, and we put the um, application to the police chief, the fire um, chief, and as well as the code office, and they all come back with a recommendation to approve. Good. Public comment on the, on this uh, order. See none. Close the public comment and uh, ask for a motion. Move so approval. Second. Uh, comments? 
Councilor Caterino. Yeah, um, it, this is up in my neck of the woods. <laughs> um, so I know it's a very popular event. Uh, it's kind of cool to stop by and see what they do with the dogs and the things they run them through. And uh, it brings a lot of people into Scarborough, too. So uh, nice. I, I'm very right. supportive of this. Great. Uh, hmm. Motion. Already did, sir. Motion's done. Deliberation. Uh, any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Order 18-27. Act on the request from the town clerk to appoint election clerks <coughs> pursuant to Title 21A, Chapter 7, Section 503-1. And I'd ask the town clerk to introduce this. Uh, this appointment is, is noted as required by state law. We do it every two years. And um, the election clerks hold the office for two years from the date of appointment or until the successor is appointed. So in another two years, we'll do it all over again. Good. Public comment. Anyone wishing to comment, please approach the podium. Seeing none. Uh, motion. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Councilor Caterina. Um, I just want to thank all of these people for uh, stepping up and being willing to work at elections. I know I was an election worker for a number of years, and uh, it's fun. It's, it's an interesting thing to do, and you're part of the whole democratic process. So thank you for stepping up. Uh, anyone wishing to ever uh, uh, contribute their time, just please contact the uh, town clerk. Uh, be happy to have a discussion with you about what's involved. Uh, all in favor, uh, further questions? Uh, two questions. One, uh, well, a question and a comment. I just wanted to ask it. I haven't had a chance to go through the list. Um, the, the clerk goes through and makes sure that each person is eligible because there are sometimes party officials yes. that are assigned but really shouldn't be. I just want to make sure. We do. Okay. Yes. And then I just wanted to, I mean, if you guys see the list, it's a very, very lengthy list of volunteers that come in. I just want to say thank you to all of them, um, especially when uh, we have multiple elections. Um, because we don't pass our budget on time. Um, so they do a lot of work. And I just want to say thank you to them for their commitment. Other comments? Seeing none. Katie. I'm just going to say I'm going to hope that we don't have multiple <laughs> <laughs> budget elections this year. <laughs> thank you. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Let's start, start with Councilor Gazo. We'll work our way down. Uh, thank you. Uh, had two meetings bet between the now and the last council meeting. Um, the Long Range Planning Committee met on um, March 23rd, and we discussed um, the process for reviewing some of the draft components that are starting to filter through from the uh, consultant for the comprehensive plan. We got an update on the ROI tool and the, and the process. A very, um, it, it's going to be a, a very, very useful tool, but a very complex tool. Uh, so it's going to take some time to get accustomed to it. But certainly, I think once it's up and running and, and staff gets familiar with it, I think it's a tool that will uh, aid us in a, in a lot of uh, a lot of the decision-making process. It's not designed to be the end-all, be-all. It's just a tool. So I want to keep that in mind. It's not going to be the gateway for decisions. It's just <coughs> another tool. Um, we did uh, a review of the draft for the framework of the comprehensive plan and actually introduced one of the sections for transportation um, that was sent to the transportation committee, which met on the 27th and reviewed the plan um, more for continuity um, and to start getting into the weeds a little bit of the sections and um, really kind of chewed on uh, how much detail really to get into. The comprehensive plan is supposed to be kind of a guideline and a, and a, and a general approach. So we're, we're, we're working with how much detail to include and, and what, what uh, types of topics we want to include in the section. So we have a, have a nice rough draft from the, um, from the consultant. We're starting to dig into that, and um, we should be taking that up again at the next meeting to try and fine tune that section a little bit better. Thank you. I'll say it's nothing to report. The same. Thank you. Councilor. Um, Councilor Kayazo covered long range planning. Uh, I wasn't able to make the senior meeting uh, being away. Um, communications, I'm hoping we can meet. <laughs> seems like we have a, I won't say snowstorm, but whatever. Or, um, But it'll be April 12th, 530. And then ordinance is the 19th at 430. 
So just a reminder on those, that's it. And uh, probably should say that the uh, focus on budget uh, hearings, yeah. uh, getting out in the community, that schedule was sort of a cornerstone of the spring right. initiative of the communications committee. Councilor Foley. Uh, not too late to get your tickets for the Saturday's uh, Taste of the Town uh, Gala that is in support of the Eastern Trail Alliance. Uh, time Pilots will be playing, so some a fun night out dancing. I think the whole town could use a fun night out. So I encourage you to get your tickets. Uh, and I'm going to make one more plug for my buddy Bill Green because uh, Bill and Denny did put out, uh, there's going to be an auction item that is uh, an opportunity to spend a full day on the water with Bill Green and Denny Denham, and uh, they're a treat to spend a day with. I had the opportunity last year. Um, whether you want to fish or just learn every little historical piece of information <laughs> about uh, Casco Bay, it's, it's a wonderful day. So uh, get your tickets for Saturday, and that's the only committee that I've done thank since we last met. Thank you. Councilor Rowan. Uh, thank you. Um, the Scarborough Housing Alliance met um, while I was out of town, um, but I, I do know that they um, uh, wrote some letters to solicit some participation in the uh, affordable housing RFP that they have out. Um, and they also uh, have written a letter of support um, for the Bessie Commons Phase 2 um, that's being sent to uh, uh, Maine Housing. Um, <coughs> Historic Preservation also met. Uh, we met last night. A um, couple things to note. One is that they are um, hoping to open the Honeywell House to the public uh, coming this fall on September 22nd. Um, there is a, uh, they received a request uh, at the Historical Society to open the house for the Libby family reunion uh, for a couple hours. And so they decided that, boy, it'd be great while we were doing that to also invite the public to come in and see mm -hmm. it. It's been a couple of years since that's been open to the public. Um, and it's, it's kind of neat to stick your head in there and learn the history. A um, couple other things. Uh, we're continuing to talk about a signage program. Um, and uh, one of the things we were talking about last night were like neighborhood and corner signs about, for instance, like Libby Corner, which is over where the um, Sands Club is, which I found interesting. Uh, and, uh, and some of the other just little neighborhoods in town and kind of uh, nooks as well as um, exploring what we could do to mark some of the um, historically significant properties in town. Um, and lastly, we uh, also discussed um, the contribution to the comprehensive plan. Um, I think they might be a little bit late, but hopefully it's not too late to get that in um, if they're in the draft process. Um, that's all I have. Uh, can you remind us what the uh, affordable housing timetable is for the RFP? I believe it's April that we were hoping to get submissions back, but I, I could be mistaken. The end so of April. it's sooner yeah. than later. Sooner yes. than later. Yeah. Good. It's like next week. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I haven't had too many meetings since our last meeting, so it's going to be brief. Um, obviously, we had the workshop this evening with the library. I can tell you that they're going to be extremely appreciative for the time that you gave them. And, and I do want to thank uh, Nancy and uh, their board for the presentation. It was very thorough, and it's always nice to hear from them. Um, I do want to share also that um, you know, part of our job as counselors, we are liaisons to many boards and many committees. And so, you know, they, they are one example of, of, of a group that is extremely appreciative of the relationship that the council has um, with them and keeping um, in touch and communicating. And so um, I'm sure that all of the other committees that we sit on, um, so that they're, they're very happy. We've always had a very strong relationship with the library board. So um, I, I know that they're going to be appreciative. Um, did want to mention we were supposed to have an appointments committee meeting yesterday because it was the first Monday, but um, um, the chairman uh, kind of um, did some, um, uh, I can't say it, uh, poor planning. <laughs> There's the five P's, right? Because poor planning produces problems. Um, so I apologize to my colleagues. Um, but I did want to mention that I did have a meeting today with um, the human resource director to talk about negotiations. Um, and so I'll be, we'll be providing an update because there is a contract. Um, and I know that we have this attention to that this, this coming year. Um, and then I did want to mention also that I actually received an inquiry today that someone is, um, an additional person is actually interested in the cable TV committee. He is the former, he is a former member who didn't realize that his term had expired um, and um, 
simply uh, we forgot about that. So I wanted to thank <laughs> Mr. Dillon, Art Dillon, for reaching out. And he said that he does want to continue in that capacity. Um, so uh, we are moving forward. And I will have a, that's two, I know. Um, <laughs> I will have a list of all of the vacancies uh, no later than the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Town manager's report. Yes, a couple of items just to mention quickly. Uh, <coughs> the commercial industrial revaluation is going to pick up speed. Uh, we've communicated by letter uh, to all businesses affected, and many of them have actually responded to us with questions, so that work is underway. I believe field work, actually getting out physically, visiting these properties will start next week, and will uh, stay uh, very brisk throughout the time they complete it. At the same time, we're also converting our software to a new vision system. And it's important that we get that done so this new data can be actually loaded into the new system so we'll have to touch it twice. So uh, pleased to say that everything is on track in that regard. Uh, incidentally, if you hear from businesses that they have questions or concerns, by all means, uh, pass them on to me, uh, If should you hear uh, any issues in the community. Uh, we've also been contacted, as has every other community, uh, through FEMA and their flood maps. Uh, mm. I've read the letter three times and I'm still not sure what it says. Uh, <laughs> staff has been in touch with folks at FEMA. Um, it doesn't appear that anything's been officially initiated, so there's no kind of clock ticking, but I think it's an omen or an indicator anyway um, that that's probably likely to come back around. And the issuance of the maps formally will initiate a. Uh, a 90-day period for uh, review, comment, and potential appeal. So as soon as uh, we're aware that uh, there's clarity in that regard, I'll certainly tell you, but it, it looks as though that's what's going to happen later in the spring. Uh, the public safety building, things are progressing very well. Uh, I see Chief Thurlow and Chief uh, Moulton here. Uh, they are uh, meeting at least weekly with the design team, it seems, or perhaps more. Uh, a big moment today was we did submit our uh, DEP and our recore application. Uh, that's really a critical path issue to this project and any other development project. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a long lead time associated with review by these regulatory agencies. So it's important that we are on track in terms of making that submission. I appreciate the consultants really working hard to stay on track. And we've we have received some promising indications that uh, the review period is likely to be less than we had hoped. Uh, which still puts us on a path for construction uh, in the late August, September time frame. And that really ends up being critical. It's important we get the field work, the uh, site work and foundation work done before the weather sets in so we can continue working. Uh, certainly in this day and age, they can work through the winter. It just costs more. You have to tent it or put accelerants in, um, in the materials. Uh, so we're hopeful to be able to stay on track. Uh, communications tower, I believe I reported at the last council meeting that we're, we were exploring what our options are. And as a, as a group, we've decided to stay with the original proposal, which is to build a, the necessary communications tower adjacent to the new building, kind of in between us here. Um, that tower uh, will be built to a height and, and sufficiency uh, to handle other infrastructure, cellular and otherwise, mm -hmm. should we wish to pursue that. That's a decision that I'd like this council to take up in the coming months, but I don't want to rush it. I think that needs its own process, and I say that based on community dialogue and conversation around the communications tower ordinance that was updated about a year and a half ago. Um, but there certainly are benefits to us in terms of revenue uh, to the town, but also for our residents. I, as I recall, the impetus for updating our communication tower ordinance was really a, a cry from the community saying we need better service in town. So I suspect some of that still exists, but I would suggest we have a process to really understand that before we go forward. Uh, last two things, Eastern Trail. Uh, there is uh, fundraising efforts that continue. Uh, our staff is working very hard with consultants. Uh, we're work moving through the final design phase, and we're nearing the, the point of right-of-way acquisition. We do not expect to need to, to physically acquire your property, but even um, easements require us to go through a very um, specific process that includes uh, appraisals and compensation potentially. Uh, it's a pretty critical step. Uh, I believe there's eight different properties, uh, property owners that will be uh, rekindling our conversation with. We've certainly had past conversations, but it's been years in some cases. And lastly, just to put on your schedule, uh, there are a number of workshops in the, on the horizon. Uh, next Wednesday at your special meeting night for the budget uh, first reading. 
we do hope we will be doing a, uh, a TIF overview. This is intended to be kind of um, a, a 101, if you will, kind of the lay the foundation, the fundamentals of what they are and what they aren't. Uh, really in advance of what I expect will be a formal request from uh, the, the folks at Scarborough Down sometime spring, early summer. I don't know exactly when, but I think it's important to really get ahead of that and to lay some foundation with the council. Um, then on May 2nd, uh, we'd like to present the master campus plan to the council. Uh, our consultants uh, have worked with staff. I think Councilor Chiazzo has had some involvement through the formation of that. We'd like to share the results of that with the public and with the council and get your feedback. And lastly, on May 16th, the Turnpike Authority is looking at doing a fairly significant widening along long stretches of the mm -hmm. Turnpike, including through Scarborough. And so they're doing an outreach effort. Um, I think they're looking at an extra lane in certain areas. And so they're making, a, I think, the appropriate outreach uh, to sit with us and to make us aware of the process and the project. So thank you for your attention. I'm certainly available for questions. Questions of the town manager? Uh, Councilor Cummins. Start Councilor Bayba. Um, so before the comment, I do actually have a question maybe for the chair or the chair ordinance. So that we received a comment this evening regarding a, um, um, around the dog um, uh, dogs ordinance and uh, the laws that were implemented. Um, is something being, I didn't understand the context of why that was brought forward. Is, is that being considered or something that has been mentioned before? Um, I was surprised to see that too because I have absolutely I've heard from nobody about any changes or okay. So I, I just want to make sure because I, I don't know what the genesis of that was. Yeah. No, the, no discussions uh, between the ordinance okay. committee uh, members and me about that. So okay. came as a surprise. Although um, I, I just want to say um, it seems like spring's finally here, so uh, I hope at least we can maybe mm -hmm. stay dry, right. but it's not snowing. But. I have nothing Perhaps else. the timing of that, I know National, uh, the Maine Audubon did issue their annual uh, plover and, and lease turn um, report, and I think some of that information was, uh, was directed at you this evening. Oh, so okay. that time <coughs> we had something to do with it. Okay, thank you. Councilor comments. Councilor Bieber. Oh, I'm set. Thank you. Set. Go through. Uh, so uh, clearly the, uh, the upgrade in this room was terrific. Um, but it, are we planning to keep that up all the time? Because it is <laughs> totally freaking me out. I got to be honest. <laughs> I didn't realize I had as much gray hair. <laughs> we can oh, change no. that. Yeah. <laughs> we were going to go for a close up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> Thank you. Good job in there. <laughs> um, so I was just going to say uh, that the plovers have are starting to arrive, and the new or the ordinance change that that date has hit uh, the time of year when dog owners need to really be uh, step up and be aware uh, of where those restricted areas are. Um, I took those comments as just being supportive of what has yeah. been uh, working and their appreciation for uh, you know that compromise and having it continue. So. Um, I do. I haven't seen anything come out from Carrie yet, but I know there will be opportunities for people who want to volunteer uh, in the mornings and in the evenings on the beaches uh, to help monitor as the plovers start to nest. Um, and it's a it's a fun duty. It's to me, it's one of the better volunteer mm -hmm. opportunities there is around town. I mean, to get up and have a sunrise on the beach is not a bad gig. So uh, please pay attention to that if it's something that interests you. We take. I know she can take as many bodies as she can get. So. Um, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Absolutely. Katerina. Yeah, um, I just wanted to talk just very briefly about the presentation by the manager and superintendent. I certainly appreciate it, and I'll be you know, looking forward to looking at all of this. And I was thinking back to my first year in the council, which was 2013, when I'll never forget handing back the budget to the superintendent because they came in with something like a 12 or 13 percent increase is what the former superintendent was looking for and we were like I don't think so um, and I just want to remind people that this is a you know the preliminary numbers uh, the finance committee still got work to do both finance committees so don't freak out yet about you know the numbers we're looking at um, I, d I I see us moving more and more towards state uh, stabilizing the taxes because since 2010 you know you've had some 
some um, external factors, i.e. the state, and the state's done a lot of transferring um, um, their responsibilities, to be honest with you, on to us as municipalities, there have been cuts to municipal revenue sharing, school funding, our school funding formula, because of the success of this town, um, we've been punished for our success, if you want to call it that, and so we're now called a minimum receiver. The good news about being a minimum receiver is at least you know what you're getting or not getting uh, every year, which I think lends itself to, to more tax stability. So um, I, I definitely encourage folks to come to the four sessions that we're having. If we need to add more sessions, I think we'd be open to doing that, but come, ask questions. That's what they're for, um, and we're happy to, you know, this, there's no secrets here. Um, so we want to make sure everyone understands exactly where their tax money is going. So that's it. Thank you. Peter. Yeah, I think just kind of continuing that theme, and, and I, think, I think, you know, as alluded to earlier tonight, there's lots of things going on in the town right now. I think um, there's just a lot of tensions, I think. This budget, I just hope we all can find a way to talk about it, respect everybody's viewpoint, have the forums to have the back and forth conversations we need to have as a community. But let's do it civilly and respectfully, because I think it's really important for all of us to go forward. We need to think of how we heal from this point forward. So I think how we all conduct ourselves during the budget process is going to, we're all going to have strong opinions, uh, but how we conduct ourselves as a community, I think is going to be really important. So first, I uh, want to apologize to my fellow counselors and to Nancy for missing the workshop this morning. That was completely on me. I looked at the uh, schedule and it said 7 p.m. and I looked no further. Shame on me. And uh, I didn't dive deep enough into the uh, agenda to see the 6 p.m. So my apologies. Um, rest assured, I very much am familiar with the roles of the library and do support it 100%. So I will go back and watch again <laughs> as my annual refresher. But I, I did want to extend my apologies for that. Um, I, and I very much appreciate the comments of the town manager uh, at his closing remarks for presenting the budget. I really hope that as a community we can separate um, all of the issues and focus on the merits of the budget. And you know, really a budget is a reflection of a community's priorities. And uh, I think it's important regardless of our positions and where we stand and what our beliefs are, we have a really uh, in-depth discussion around the budget and, and try not to bring some of those superfluous issues into it. So um, we do have a lot of work to do. Um, it's going to be a very long couple of months, especially for the Finance Committee. Um, certainly with questions and concerns, please reach out to us. Don't assume anything. Don't make assumptions. Um, we're all available. We're all accessible. Um, you know, concerns and questions need to come in. Now's the time to start getting involved because uh, the process is going to go very, very quickly. Thank you. Um, uh, as you probably know, Larissa Carkett really has done a good job uh, with our e-newsletter, yeah. and, and she has been suggesting that it might be appropriate for uh, town councilors to contribute more information, uh, much in the way we provide <coughs> also comments and committee reports. So I've accepted that challenge, and uh, uh, so the first of these short articles will start to appear, and I'll try to do anything that people think is appropriate to put in, just let me know. I'll write something up. As you all know, I have an unlimited amount of free time. <laughs> uh, Stop bragging. It's, it's, not, it's not golf season yet, so that's the only reason you get about three weeks left. Uh, uh, I did uh, appreciate the presentation yeah. by uh, Superintendent Kuchenberger and the town manager, Tom Hall. I thought it was uh, uh, very helpful, the booklets continue to get better. Yeah. Uh, I thought the school is, you can tell under this new leadership that the school is listening to how can we speak to people so they can understand it. I also think that the, it's important for the town to realize that we've been in uh, a free fall revenue situation for, I don't know, the last six, seven, eight years. Eight plus eight years. Uh, uh, and we would really like to be able to be better long-range planners of our budget and have more stability. And you cannot have stability in your planning when you don't have stability in your revenue stream. And that's really been the problem. 
uh, we have finally reached the point where they can't take any more money away from us. Uh, and as a consequence, we're in a much better position to be able to predict. We can control the spending, and um, the seven of us plus the town manager and the superintendent and the school board can work together to decide on how much we're going to spend. We're finally reaching this point. Uh, this is the last year uh, where we had to really revert from an inordinate amount of fund balance monies being used to a conventional amount of fund balance monies being used. Mm -hmm. And so I expect that we are turning the corner, that budgets in the future will be much more readily consistent with what our goals are. Uh, this is a challenging year given that uh, we had over $2 million of fund balance monies used last year, and we're down to, I don't know what the number is in the booklet, but it's a, it's a conventional number. Uh, and so uh, I'm excited about getting that message out to the community. Uh, I'm excited about the fact that we're trying to do things better in many ways. Uh, the budget forum that we were holding really weren't getting good reviews. Uh, and so we wanted to be able to reach out to more people. Already 71 people, we didn't have half that many show up at the budget forum. Mm -hmm. So we've reached twice as many people already and we now have four more sessions planned where, where people can come and get their questions asked in a comfortable setting. Uh, not having to stand at a podium and watch uh, a bunch of people uh, uh, look at them. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm encouraged by the new format. I appreciate the effort that has gone in to coming up with ideas to better present our budget to the community. And, uh, and I welcome the sessions that are coming up. So thank you very much. And I'll accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor. Thank you. None of us are tonight. Mm -mm. I didn't know what was tonight.